and welcome to another episode of More Than Dice. I'm Gonzo. I'm still not Kathy. And John is off for the day. He had some other things to take care of, so of course I invited Jim on to hang out with me today. Um, so we are <laughs> on episode 246. Uh, today we're going to be talking about some LVO news, painting and talks with James Wapple. And uh, we're going to do some convention talk because some people asked some questions about running a convention for me this, um, this week. And uh, they were very shocked about the hidden costs of running a convention that people don't see. And they were kind of complaining uh, about things that were happening at LVO. And I was like, mm, let me educate you real quick type thing. So... Um, we're going to be talking about that. But before we do that, we need to get to the business. We want to thank Muse on Minis for hosting our files and getting it out for everybody. Don't forget, if you go over and check them out, they have quite a few tokens and everything that you could check out uh, for your gaming tabletop needs. And uh, if you use the code more than dice, all one word, you get a uh, percentage off your order and we get a small little kickback, which helps us with our fees. Uh, we want to thank Parabellum Wargames. We were talking about Conquest in the pre-ramble um, and going over some of their models. Uh, also, if you like their stuff and want to learn how to play, you can also get 10% off uh, your purchase from them. Uh, and you can get it from uh, using the code more than dice, all one word again, and you get 10% off. Uh, we want to thank Midnight Heroes. Um, our boy is going to be doing some cool new models and a special chibi model for warfare weekend this year um and he's going to have a new kickstarter coming up where they're going to be doing stl so keep an eye on that and if you like their stuff there um make sure you go over there and use the code more than dice all one word again can you see a pattern here james i see a pattern okay um and you can get it's all a one discount. word it's all one word you can get a discount also on that uh on his product we want to thank turbo dork if you like some good metallic and color shifting paints, make sure you go check them out. Uh, especially their color shift paints. They're very awesome. And their colored metallic paints are very, very good. Um, we'll see about getting a discount code for y'all on that too. Um, but um, go and check them out all the time. Um, and like I said, John is gone this week, so Jim is going to be hanging out with us. He's going to be painting some models. He has been working on this one model that you see right now for about 30 minutes, and I'm sure he's almost done with it. Be ready for a Golden Demon award-winning trophy to be put in his new cases that he's got uh, in any second. Um, we're timing him to see how long it takes for him to be completely, and I want to say completely done, but, you know, near done. And we'll take a good shot of it. Maybe he'll post a picture and saying, hey, this is what it looks like after... 10 minutes on more than dice. <laughs> uh, so, other than that, guys, we really appreciate you coming on. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you watching. You name it, we appreciate it. Um, it everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be fun. We want you to come out to our shows. We want you to come out to the conventions. Um, make sure you keep yourself very, very safe because we want to see you again. Uh, make sure you keep yourself healthy. Make sure you come and hang out with us. If you see one of us, say hi. We like hearing from people that listen to our podcast. Um, maybe if you come up and show that you listen to our podcast, you might get some free swag. We're always looking at that. Um, so, um, do we have any shout-outs this week, Jim? Do you know of anybody? Is there, is there anybody are, I don't think I saw any shout-outs that we need to. Um, but, doesn't mean we don't shout-out to y'all, our listeners. Such lovely people. Lovely, lovely people. Um, so, um, let's get to the really, really deep, deep personal issues that is plaguing us right now um, that I know that the entire community wants to hear. Jim, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, that's going to be some blackberry ginger ale and the Kraken. Okay. Not much of a ginger ale person. Kraken's not bad. Um, I am doing some good old Maker's Mark, uh, just a little one finger shot type in there. Um, going to be kind of taking it easy, trying to make sure I don't, you know, get too many calories in my body because I'm trying to lose a little bit of my gut. I'm just trying to be as healthy as possible. Um, so other than that, um, guys, 
We really, really appreciate you coming on. Please take care of yourself. If you see something, say something. Stand up for something. Make sure that you are looking after each other. Cheers. Cheers. <sighs> Whoo. Hold on a second. Go try one again. That burns a bit. Mm. So I'm going to go and switch over to the painting cam. Jim is going to be working on his models. I got to work on my models. I'm trying to get all my Orgoth done so I can play with them at Adepticon. Kathy? Kathy's in the channel. Say hi, Kathy. People want to hear from you. Hopefully soon we can get Kathy in here and she can actually hang out with us again. Because we love Kathy. I'm going here. Hopefully she won't be too upset if I do a review on the onion, the glass onion during this uh, media <laughs> section. All right. So I am going to be working on my Orgoth. These are the Witch Coven. Um, they do spells and they help Jax out. So it's a unit of three. These are the new 3D prints. <sighs> Uh, from Privateer Press, and then I'll be working on the Orgoth models, uh, the Tyrant Jacks. Um, just working on the bodies. For anybody that know, I'm just doing a good dry brush. I'm making them really dark metal uh, dry brushing, so they're kind of a, a black metal in a way. Uh, Jim, you'll have to kind of help me out on um, any word on Moloch. You'll have to keep. Kind of help me keep eye on chat because that's John's duty, and since John's not here, it falls to your duty. So you'll have to do that. Just keep an eye on chat for me, please. Um, I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that, so I'll have to go do that. Well, I already made a duty. Oh, that's not that duty. Okay, sorry. I thought you were talking about the other kind of duty. Sorry, um, our good friends at Midnight Heroes sent me a message and said, hey, we're trying to do this with this model for Warfare Weekend. What do you think about this look? And I gave him his arsenal. Made sure he did it. He was like, I need some information. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is um, working with this. Uh, my first color that I'm doing is just a gun metal from um, Army Painter as my base metal. So it just gets a good dark color on it type thing. So we'll get that started. Um, you don't have to pay attention to me. You can pay attention to Jim's models because he is, you know, the the man when it comes to painting. I'm going to do, give me one second. I am going to set up something so I can also watch chat on here. On my phone. I just said, uh, uh, I said, Kathy was, has been typing a few things in the chat, just answering some questions from folks. Somebody say something in chat so I can see it real quick. I'm going to put it on my... Can anybody... Kathy, just type thank you. John is taking just the night off. All right, Captain Mizzy, thank you so much for posting something so I can now see it. All right, so before we get started and talking about stuff, I wanted to, you know, someone had mentioned, you know, why aren't certain companies streaming at LVO? They're like, why isn't this game company doing a stream? Why isn't this game company doing X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera? Well, there's something that people don't understand. There's a lot of hidden fees to running a convention. One of the worst hidden fees is internet usage. For the people who don't know, you can't stream on Wi-Fi. I mean, it's just 
blatant, you know, stupid. Uh, you it, it would just be horrible. And everybody's using the same Wi-Fi, so, you know, it wouldn't happen. I mean, try using the same Wi-Fi to stream with, you know, thousands of other people doing it at the same time. Just not going to happen. Um, and so you have to buy a, you know, internet connection on, you know, you know, a wired connection. And so people are like, well, yeah, just buy that. Does anybody want to guess at a smaller convention, you can guess on mine for Warfare Weekend, how much a daily rate is for a wired connection at Warfare Weekend? I'll give you anybody a guess. Give me a number. Okay, Legionnaires. Legionnaires is saying 500. Should they have to frame it in the form of how many tickets and memberships do people have to buy to make up for it? <laughs> sort of like the Jeopardy frame it in the form of for a question. For a question, no, you can just. So far, we've got about $500 per day. Well, just to let you know, uh, I get a discounted rate on that because we're a small convention. Warfare Weekend has to pay roughly $200 a day to stream. Here's the kicker. It's $200 a day plus plus, which means they add taxes, licensing fees, and all those other sweet things. So for us to stream at Warfare Weekend cost us $800. Give a rough or take. Roughly, give or take, you know. Yeah, it, it's a stupid dumb amount. I, I mean, I have a problem telling you that it's going to cost us, you know, it'll cost, you know, roughly $800. So when people complain about, you know, why aren't you streaming or why can't you stream and I should, you should do a stream, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, you got streaming money? Now, you think about it. We're a small convention. Warfare Weekend's a small convention. Imagine what LVO would have to pay. Now, I'm sure they could try to get in a contract and have it, but then you've got the contract. But then that was probably through Frontline Gaming has that contract. You know, you say if Privateer Press wants to, they'd have to pay for that, which would probably, I would say, almost a thousand dollars a day for them to stream a game. So, and they start on Thursday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days, about four grand to stream a game. Stream games, I should say. Which, you may got that four thousand, you know, dollars worth of information to going on. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. There's a lot of hidden fees that people don't understand and don't know. Uh, Jim and I were talking before the show, and he was like, oh, yeah, what about tables and chairs? And I'm like, oh, yeah, tables and chairs are another thing. Um, you only get so many tables and chairs, and then after a certain amount, you have to pay for those tables and chairs. It's D-U-M dumb type stuff. So... Whenever you go and you ask why they're not doing stuff or why it's not happening, just think about how much it costs. Would you rather have more games and more times and more fun? Or would you like to have streaming? You want more prize support or do you want streaming? You want more door prizes or do you want streaming? Do you want XYZ or streaming? Do you want XYZ or or more tables. It's ridiculous. And it's just going up. I know that uh, Gen Con booth prices went up astronomically. I know some people were complaining. I don't want to say complaining, but they were like, crap, I can't afford a bo booth at Nova this year because the prices went up. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, the booth, I think Gen Con's 10x10 10 10 non-corner booth is like three grand for the weekend. And that's that's letting you sell something. So that's not counting all of your expenses of getting there, getting back, your pallet fees, your hotel, your food. And and then, you know, all the other fees that Gen Con puts on, oh, you wanna have something hung from the ceiling? Well you gotta pay this. You want something hung here, you gotta pay that. 
So there's, you know, there's a ton of fees that people don't recognize. Oh, you want to plug in? Oh, well, here's the fee to plug into an outlet. They still don't charge those because uh, for a while they were doing like stickers on the floor. And we just keep thinking, wow, there's there's people that are spending thousands of dollars to have temporary stickers put on the floor that people are going to mostly be standing on. Oh, yeah. They, you still have to weekend. pay for that. Yeah, you have to pay for those, too. So they're, they're still doing those. I wasn't sure if that was something they experimented with. And people said, no, this is stupid. I'm not paying for that. Oh, no, people still do. People still pay for that. Um, uh, Legionnaires, it is it is a very cost issue that a lot of vendors have to look at. And so, you know, so like some vendors are like, oh, hi, I'll just join in with another booth and share booth cost. Well, they have a special pricing for people that share booth costs. So you have to pay an additional fee so yeah you get to divide it up between two people but they charge you a fee on top of that to have dual people at a booth um also hey what happens if you run out of an item um at gen con if you sell out of an item before a certain time frame you get fined um so you just got to Think before you speak and realize that it's it comes down to money, guys. As much as it comes down to, you got to start thinking that, you know, things are going to cost and it's going to cost you. It's going to cost those people a ton of money. I mean, you think about it. Some people pay for a 40 by or 20 by 20 by 20, which is four booth spaces. That right there is $12,000, give or take. And that's not even a corner booth. If you want a corner booth, it's even more money. So they charge you even more money if you want your booth to be on the corner. So just, you know, there's so many fees to everything. So think before you speak. Realize that it could, you know, it, it comes down to cost. And there are certain things that, and that's the reason why people, we, and, and conventions get very picky about, yes, you have to buy a badge to attend our convention because you're taking up space and you're taking up spots that someone else could, even though you're not. Now, Adepticon has gone back to, you know, you can attend for free, but, you know, if you're going to put models down, you're taking up rental spots you've got to pay things cost money i mean i would never want to see you know what the bill for adepticon would be i I could probably contact hank and he would tell me but it's still i mean it's just ridiculous so while speaking of lvo what was some of the there was some uh, nefarious things that went on there (sighs) okay so if you haven't seen um one of our friends, Caleb Wisenbeck, did um, a model and got it stolen from the GW booth. Uh, if you're on my Facebook group or you're on Facebook friends or you're friends with him or any of the things, everybody's posting about it. But his, I believe his entire bag was stolen um, with some very, very, I mean, he's a good artist. He's a good painter. Um, so some very good models uh, were stolen that were supposed to be shown off this week. And... Yeah, his model case was stolen. I'm going to tell you right now, if you had that model case, you might as well just return it or, you know, chunk it in the trash because if everybody knows what those models look like, you're busted. You're not going to be able to play with them anywhere. You're going to you're going to get busted. So, I really would appreciate if somebody, you know, returned them. But um and and these things happen. They suck. They shouldn't, but they happen. Don't be a dick. You know, one of our mottos. Don't be a dick. But I also learned, yeah, it is disgusting. Um, because that he, he, he probably spent a lot of time on that and a lot of work. And people don't get to see it in person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did talk to some other people that went and... Uh, people were stealing terrain off of tables. 
Um, somebody stole a bunch of terrain off of uh, tables this year. Come on, people. Really? Come on. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 dum dumb and it's very disrespectful to the people that put the hard effort into this. I mean, people work really hard on their models. People work really hard on tables. Don't be a dick. So, but there was some cool news that came out of Gen Con or out of LVO. Uh, Jim, you have all the information on that. So why don't you, Terabay, what happened there? There was a massive amount of miniature reveals there. It seems to me almost more than usual. And it was across all the all the different systems, well, except for one, but that wasn't really a big surprise. The thing that obviously people, <laughs> they sent it to my attention was all the new Lizard Man stuff. So a new Slan Mage Priest, because I'm pretty sure the existing one might still be the old metal one. So there is a new Slan Mage Priest new saurus figures which the last time there were new saurus figures was 2003 and that i know that because i actually got them when they were brand new in 2003 and they had not changed whatsoever since then so they now have sauruses they look pretty much like the blood bowl saurus figures just with well kind of the same old weapons and slightly different looking shields the thing that really piqued my interest were the, and this is all for, again, Lizardmen slash Seraphon, these Raptodon hunters. So basically, skinks on little chickens. The little, uh, basically, uh, the, the Saurus Cold One Riders, these are uh, maybe half the size of those, 50%, the, 60% the size of them, whatever. I just find that interesting because many years ago, probably in 5th edition Warhammer, Lizardmen used to have skinks on tiny little raptors. And it's interesting to see those come back around again. And I think they have a regular sort of a unit type of thing. And then they also have sort of a command version of that. Let me see if we can find the command version of it here. There's also some War Cry stuff. You have... Uh, so, Blades of Corn, the Claws of Karanak. It's it's just it's chaosy looking stuff. Um, very much a war cry, war band, typical kind of thing. And I think there was another one too. There was also another war band that they had. And I think it was a slightly different one here. A Raptodon Charger. So I guess it is its own unit then. All right. Well, didn't didn't realize that was a whole unit of its own let me look at the other one here okay so yeah uh, claws of karanek i think there is a second faction too that might have also come out there was some necromunda stuff i think a new kill team also came out i'm just going to double check and see if there is a second warband for war in addition to just those okay i think that would be this one here ah, okay so uh Let's see, Askurgan True Blades. They look vaguely sort of dark elfish, kind of. Uh, the there is a kind of a war beast type thing that that light looks a little bit more interesting than the rest of the war band. I, I'm, I don't know how these new official war bands will play because uh, i know people always said that the official war bands always kind of got their lunch handed to them by the standard the uh, age of sigmar kind of adapted war bands where you took asiarchs or goblins and made them into a war band don't know if that's the same situation still or if that's changed a little bit uh that i couldn't tell you so a couple of war bands there. Again, some some Necromunda stuff also has come out, and I couldn't tell you as far as the 40k stuff, but I think it would be easy enough just to go on to the the GW site and see that because I'm sure there's about a hundred things for 40k that came out. If, if there was this much for fantasy and war cry, I'm sure there was just a ton of things. Now I don't think I still have the email from that. Let me see if I still have it. 
No, I don't have the. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, no, no, I thought I had that. So that was their uh, big release from, or their big release news. I'm sure they're probably saving some things for Adepticon. So my guess is some of the things we didn't hear about at all at LVO, those will probably be announced at Adepticon. Yeah, they always have a big GW announcement at Adepticon. So, Because last year at Adepticon, there was a ton of stuff for Lord of the Rings. All the a new campaign book, the Easterlings, a whole bunch of new miniatures of all different types, and that was uh, that was announced at Adepticon. So it's possible they were saving some news for that. Well, well, I won't be able to say. I think uh, Wednesday night, right? Is that when uh, GW does their big reveal party at Adepticon? Uh, I thought it was, I, I can't remember. I I don't, I don't go to it, so I have no clue, but. I think it's Wednesday night, and you need to... Well, I think the first time they did it, you had to get tickets for it. It was free, but you still need to at least have a ticket for it because, well, I think they just anticipated so many people wanting to crowd in there. Oh, yeah, people want to jump in and see what's going on and what they're paying, what they're going to be spending their money on. So uh, it was interesting to see that uh, almost... uh, kind of a whole new lizard man army uh some of the other bigger war beasts those are newer than 2003 those kind of came out in 2012 well, they're the new lizard man stuff for the most part is is actually getting to be 10 12 years old now i i who knows maybe adepticon they flash some news about maybe the return of square basing <laughs> because Years ago, they said, well, that's going to be years from now. And it is now years from that time. Yeah, so Old World is, or whatever it is. It would probably be Warhammer Old World. And they they made it pretty clear that it would not be War Master. It was going to be a smaller scale. It was going to be basically the Warhammer that used to be. Now, I don't know how it's going to work or anything like that, but I would... We would hope that they would have some, say, new Bretonians, new Tomb Kings, and not just more Sigmarines in on square bases. That that would not be wouldn't want to see that. No, you never know. It is GW. I get. I I've never played Sigmar. Uh, actually, uh, on the topic of another thing. I'll be curious to see what sort of new stuff Mantic might have out. I know last year the the big thing was Armada, and I I don't know if Armada is still going as, as strong. That was looking really interesting, and I've seen a bunch of uh, gameplay videos. It it plays pretty well, like way better than the dreaded Dreadfleet, which lasted all about thirty seconds. <laughs> And that they were literally just chucking those things in the garbage at, at the game stores, because uh, that's just about how well received those things were. So this this worked out much better. Now uh, the ships are all resin. I have to say, the newer sculpts are are definitely better than the original ones. Some of the sails can be a little jinky to to put on especially anything that's like a jib or whatever. But I painted a bunch of those on stream, and they have a fair amount of factions done with those now. I think at least five, if not six. So you're not stuck with just a couple. Oh, that's the dog. That's Tyson. Probably my delivery that I'm waiting on. I'm waiting on some new filament. Probably They're probably dropping it off. I don't think I've ever heard him quite that prominent before he's now if there's anybody else in the chat that was actually at is at LVO and has any other things that they can add especially filling in the gaps on the 40k stuff there that would be good Uh, it's also possible they're saving some other really big 40k news for for Adepticon yeah, which is a few short months away. I'm, I'm sure a bunch of people are trying to get 
tournament armies ready and such for Adepticon and, well, probably other contest entries. I think somebody's doing a combined thing. I think it's Privateer Press and someone else. Uh, or, or actually, I think it's Privateer Press and Conquest. No. Who? Someone is... Uh, uh, think... the, the Conquest, probably what you're thinking about is uh, Conquest and... Resin uh, Beast. Yeah, the Resin Beast is probably... It's Conquest and... Um, oh, my gosh. And Creature Caster. Creature Caster, yes. I couldn't remember. My name was... The name was blinking on me. That was... The, okay, that's the surprise combo there. Yeah, because uh, Creature Caster is um, doing judgment models. And so they're concentrating on that, and they're working together on certain things. And we're hoping that our judgment models... A.K. Captain Mizzy's probably freaking out. Are in in enough time so people can play, because they got a tournament coming up, and they're planning on coming back to Warfare Weekend, and hopefully they'll have all the cool things, all the cool things. Now, did have they started to sell STL files yet? Because no. Any company that is making models for a game directly, if they sell STL files, they will put themselves out of business. Because I will tell you right now, if you were to take, we'll say War Machine right here, and you release those STL files, that person would give that file out to everybody else. And everybody would print their own. And it, w it, would, be, it would be worthless. One of the worst things that companies could do. Oh, it games. wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be for their for their game. It would they would just be sort of special release things that wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with the Correct. game. Correct. Yeah. Now, if you were going to say, "Hey, here's here's a cool model. You know, we don't care what you do with it, and you can't use it in game or whatever," people, you know, that I can see. That I can see. Like um. Midnight Heroes. They're really they're doing a Patreon or a Kickstarter, and the models, the things that they're doing are Kickstarter models, and they're going to be STLs. Now they're not usable for anything. They're just, you know, cool Kickstarter models, and it'll be an STL file. So there is somebody that's doing a very interesting sort of a combo thing where there's digital STL files of windows, doors, arches, crenellations, things for terrain. Okay. And then they also have MDF guides to cut the foam, which you slide, and it's kind of a slot system. So the windows, the doors that you print out actually have slots in them designed for a certain width of foam. And they have these, these guides, these MDF guides, so that say something with like a proxon or whatever, you could cut your your foam with that and then slip these printed pieces on. Because building foam terrain, I mean, I've done that many, many times. The most the, the thing that takes the longest is the parts that are the smallest, like doors, windows, that sort of thing. And any sort of crenellations or whatever, those are going to take you forever. Especially if they have a certain theme like Schmandor or something like that or Schmohan. So anything that has a theme like that, that's going to take you even more time to make it distinctive and have that look towards it. But they've uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Now, of course, GW, it was funny, at the very same time, GW announced all of their Minas Tirith terrain. And it, it's sort of a modular thing. You can have an intact tower or a broken tower. And uh, and it's a tall. It's got to be at least two and a half feet tall, I think. Okay. And then other complete buildings. So it was it was strange that just as this guy's Kickstarter came out, that's when GW announced a whole bunch of like instead of just the ruined walls that look a whole lot like any 40k terrain or any Warcry terrain. This. Now, for a price, you could build Minas Tirith with it. Uh, it would be very expensive, because I'm sure those that tower kit, that is not going to be cheap. So that that's something that they might uh, un probably maybe at Adepticon, 
is uh, they tend to do their what, new releases on Saturday. So who knows? They might even have it you could, where you could pre-order it that Saturday of Adepticon or something. Talking about that, I went to a convention um, in St. Louis a uh, long time ago. It was like, I wouldn't say a long time ago. It was probably about seven years ago. And um, these guys were playing Battle of Middle Earth, and they were doing a the Siege of Minas Tirith. And they had Minas Tirith built into this huge platform. Um, and so everybody... You know, they had all these orcs and, you know, all the stuff on the outside. And they had, you know, everybody on the inside. And, I mean, it was a huge, huge building because it was built to scale type thing. So, it was huge beyond belief. It was really neat to see. It was really fun. Really interesting. I was like, man, that would be fun to play on. Uh, whoever built that, kudos to them. I mean, it was it was unbelievably huge, the menace here that they had. So, uh, Arna Michael says, Bisterium is also joined Resin Beast, which is cool. So. Because uh, I know that uh, lots of people have uh, been more and more and more have been participating in that Resin Beast each year. Yep. And they have a... And, and it was kind of weird because I'm pretty sure their booth space last year was in the place that used to be occupied by cool mini or not yeah and, they and usually have a pretty their, good size their display booth. things were where cool mini used to put their stuff for the crystal brush stuff it was it was a little freaky to, to see something in that area again that was in some ways vaguely similar I didn't think I would be seeing display cases with, with miniatures in them like that in that particular spot of the dealer's room again. I'm, I'm glad it was successful enough for him to do something like that. Well, I mean, Creature Caster has amazing models. Beastarium has, they've got created some really good models. Um, Conquest, Judgment, all have really good models. Models that would make good, you know, you know, trophy, you know, centerpiece stuff that just are really, really cool. So, not surprised one bit. So, Jim, how's that uh, Golden Demon Award meaning money model coming along? Uh, well, I, I took a little time away from him to paint a couple other ones. So, he's only just now about done. So, yeah, just while people weren't looking, painted about three of them during that break, you know, when we were <laughs> supposed to be go getting some extra drinks and such. Now, I don't know. It's not time for media section yet, is it? No, nope, we got about 15 minutes, but I haven't ah, okay. seen anybody else pay for any more ears, so these are coming off. So, but... Are you, I'm guessing you're still doing all the cool oils on your models? All oils, all the time. I've actually, I tried, oh, was it Green Stuff World sent me these things called dipping inks, which were supposed to be vaguely like, what was the army painter stuff? Speed paints, and of course you got contrast paints from GW. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because they looked a bit more like, say, the contrast paint. Just when you see them out of the jar, they looked like they were very intensely pigmented. When I tried to use them, they were not. So say something like contrast Achillean green. When you actually put that on a figure, it, I mean, it's intense. It has yes. a really strong pigmentation. These, it would just kind of be like a very, very pale turquoise on the figure itself now unlike the army painter stuff they didn't reactivate and that's why i tried the army painter stuff once and never used it again because it reactivates and that basically makes it a no-go now for me I, I actually prefer the green stuff world intensity inks more the problem is those also reactivated oh so really I don't, I don't know what's in the yeah i found out the hard way doing some song of ice and fire stuff and they were free folk units, and I went to put snow effects on them. And that was the crushed glass snow, which yeah. requires moisture. Yeah, guess what? I had all kinds of fun-colored snow. 
<laughs> they say, don't eat the yellow snow. This was yellow, green, purple. It was every color of snow. That was that was not something I was super happy about. So I never used those again. I, I really enjoyed them. They were really fantastic to use, but the reactivation part made them uh, uh, no-go from that point forward. The oils are just so much... Well, they're more rugged, okay? You're, you're painting your figures that you're using for games. You want something that can take the abuse of in and out of a case, maybe getting some dice smashed into it once in a while, or some rough handling. That happens, no matter how careful you try to be. The oils... Uh, and it's not just me. Now that they've been out there, other people I know using them enough, they can say, oh, geez, yeah. The, that army that I painted a year and a half ago with them that's been to four tournaments looks just as fine now as it did from day one. I mean, it's something I've noticed. And I don't even bother doing any kind of a varnish on them or anything like that. Uh, the oils, we've definitely found out they work out to be much cheaper because uh, while the self-spilling jar of contrast paint for $8 you could get yourself a, a, easily a 37 mil tube of oil paint that will last you and four generations of your family easily. Uh, me, not so much because obviously I'm doing a little bit more than the average person. But for the average person, well, you would get a lot of usage out of it. And they're fantastic for painting terrain. Uh, obviously, people would want to use them maybe for painting vehicles uh, let's say you want to make your own mud effects or something like that well you could mix oil paints and weathering powders together and next thing you know you've got yourself some nifty um, mud effects without having to pay MIG ammo or AK interactive quite a few dollars for a jar that's going to dry out on you believe me found out the hard way <laughs> MIG ammo sent me a bunch of jars of their mud and Anything that wasn't the, the mud that was filled but just mostly thinner, those are all dried out. So that's another thing that you can do with the oil paints if you want to do yourself some weathering effects. Everybody's got weathering powders. Mix those up with the oils and you'll have even more interesting effects. Because uh, the powders give the oils that much more thickness. So if you want to do some heavy caked on mud... You could do that. You could even throw a little bit. I could throw a little bit of a plaster in there. It would be even more uh, heavy caked on mud. Oh, the other thing I learned, this was in a, along with the Daz air dry clay for those uh, dune bases, the sand dunes, I made my own texture paste out of tile grout. Oh, yeah. And it was perfect because it already has texture. And it is strong stuff because, I mean, it has to stand up to being in a shower or a bathroom. So it's strong, very waterproof, and I love that stuff. It is fantastic. And it, like I said, it's really strong, and it's it's a heck of a lot cheaper than, say, a $15 jar of Vallejo texture paste. Much as I loved it, Vallejo texture paste. It's not, not always available because Vallejo only makes miniature painting products one quarter out of the year. All the rest of the year, they're making house paint, car paint, whatever. <laughs> they are not making miniature paint all year long, which is why it's always you go into game stores and they say, yeah, wait nine months, we'll get our new shipment in. Because they physically won't be making any more for another nine months. I remember, I think it was at Adepticon we learned that. It's It reinforced what we heard from a person that owned a game store. We just, we thought, well, man, is that really true? That doesn't make any sense. But then when we heard it, for sure, it's like, okay. That's the only make, there's no wonder it's so hard to find all the time. So, yes, if you're looking for texture paste for your bases... That is a fantastic method. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying to find some more texture ores. I'm sure they won't be any different as far as what the textures are than the Green Stuff World ones. I know some of them, they make 
like these little handles that you can use to to kind of help even out the pressure because even with the the little uh, rubber guides that Green Stuff World makes, it's still very easy to put too much pressure on one side or the other. Check out that link I sent you of that custom miniatures because they actually, their resin printed ones are pretty good. Um, and they offer handles to keep, you know, things a certain depth and thickness and such. And hey, free STL is a free STL. I will not complain, that's for sure. Um, now, was, was there any uh, STL folks that... Because uh, you still do Raging Heroes, right? No, I, I pretty much stopped all of those. Because actually, I, I still do the, the Raging Heroes. Their stuff, it can be difficult to print out. That's for sure. Although I'm hoping the, the gray resin makes that a little bit easier. I mean, I could print them out with the smoky black, but that whole issue of removing the supports on those fragile little Raging Heroes figures, that was difficult. Oh, yeah. Uh, Clay Cyanide have been fortunate. They've been making some Lord of the Rings stuff. So as long as they're doing Lord of the Rings, uh, I'll, I'll keep getting some of theirs. Uh, their most recent release had a Balrog in it. Which was, it was kind of a nice, it was a playable Balrog. Uh, their, their supports, not really. Actually, there's a, a bunch outside of, say, Titan Forge, Arch Villain, and maybe printing goes ever on. So many of the sculptors and stuff, I just, I'm better off going in the Cheeto box using the junky auto supports and not doing anything else with them, those are more reliable. Really? Yeah. Because they used well, to pay someone to do all of their, you know, all of their support stuff. And it was actually really good, and I didn't have to, I didn't worry about anything. I mean, I, you know, all their supports broke off pretty easy, and it wasn't a big issue. It's, for whatever reason, it's just, uh, now, it, it also, too, it can depend on the sculpts. So when I did Lost Kingdoms, Chaos Dwarves, those guys are so beefy, that's a whole different situation. Yeah. But the average Lost Kingdom miniature is, well, more like this. So here, we'll show you this Karen figure. And I'm going to... Okay, there we go. Yeah, you can see that. See how, that is incredibly tall. And that's a lot of their stuff is like this and really, really, really dainty. So it, it can... A lot of times, their stuff disappears. You... you open up the thing you can see oh i printed out and then you go oh well except for half the head or that leg didn't print so yeah the the kieran here that's a typical lost kingdoms type of file and i've learned just to go ahead and do my own support ton especially since for whatever reason the junky auto supports actually work really well i don't know how many times people say oh no you can't use the junky auto supports so, oh, i use that all the time Again, it, the, every resin is different, too. It, it could have as much to do with the simple resin as anything else. Could be temperature-wise. Who knows? Uh, if I can get that Anycubic Mono X going, that might act very differently than the Sonic Mini 4K. Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll be better. And, of course, well, the Mono X is... Basically the same era, same age as the uh, Sonic Mini 4K. I know what I don't know if folks are on 10K just yet. Some of the 3D printing services, they're actually on 10K now. Yeah, most everybody is either six or 8K, and most are raised four to 6K on the average. Now, of course, printer services or companies, you know, that are doing print 3D printing professionally, they're, you know, going a little bit higher. But the average person is between 4 and 6K. So, yeah, these are actually 3D prints from Diwali Miniatures. It's their January release. Oh, they also... 
they've kind of been doing a dual release, Numenor and Iron Hills. So I painted up this Dane Ironfoot on stream a couple of days ago. The They've been doing a really, really nice job. The, <laughs> the thing about Diwali is that there's not going to be weapon options. So these Numenorians, they are what they are. They don't have different shields, different heads, different weapons. If you're going to have a Numenorian archer, well, you have to wait till Diwali makes Numenorian, Numenorian archers. archers yeah. Whereas printing goes that were on, Midbury, Kurzluk, those are all modular. They're designed to have all the different weapons. Actually, I printed out a ton of these Mahood riders, and they come with different heads, and then all three, no, four different weapons. It's the spear, the club, the blowpipe, and I think there's one other thing. Because your only other option is if you can find them on the GW site is to pay about $35 for one of these, and it is a nightmare to put together. And it is all metal, so it's going to be very heavy and top-heavy. Now, Medbury is nice because, say, a Candish army, he made the chariots, the horses, the infantry with all of the weapon options, and he makes many shield designs. So he always makes at least six shields, so you can have a lot of variety in an army just by having a different shield on each guy. Uh, Legionnaire is asking, did Medbury have the camel riders? Uh, that is Kurzluk. Um, those are actually they're the same guys. This was another recent release. So there's the Army of the Dead. Did army painting series on that. Uh, and the Kurzluk, their February release is going to be uh, Army of Dale. So they are the first of all the digital digital sculptors to do a Dale army, which is interesting because that's a it's a pretty popular army. And of course they're they're also featured in that Defense of the North book, which is the latest source book. So that's handy. Really glad to see that. Uh, Kurzlik also has done a, a bunch of Easterlings, and they also did Iron Hills Dwarves. So if you want to have the Chariot and the, uh, the Ballista, that's the only one so far that has the Chariot and the Ballista. I think they have also done the uh, Easterling Dragon Emperor. I wouldn't be surprised if Diwali, maybe by March, also does the Dragon Emperor, because they've been doing a lot of Easterling files, too. Now, printing goes ever on. They just did yet another War Elephant. Uh, they also have done the Great Beast of Gogoroth, which is kind of like a mini War Elephant. And I actually was able to print out a couple of those. Well, you're asking how you spell Kurzla. Oh, let me just write that down because <laughs> it's it's a weird name. It's a weird name. So here, let me at write this down. So this way. All right. So there you go. So K H U R Z L U K. So K H U R Z L U K. That's Kurz look. Now, I think with them, you're probably going to want to make your own supports. Uh, <laughs> it was funny because at first, he had so many supports. So many supports that it would take you a half an hour just to try and remove them all. Uh, <laughs> so of those, I just automatically just do my own supports on those. Uh, and he knew that there was an issue with the supports to the point where he was actually uh, kind of uh, asking if there was somebody out there that you know, just did supports because there's those folks. That's all they do. They literally just do the supports for probably four or five different Patreon campaigns, which I didn't realize. But there's there's a whole cottage industry and in just doing supports. Now, I've always liked the printing goes over on supports because he does that umbrella, that fan style of support. So if it's a sword here, he's got a whole fan of support. He doesn't just have one or two little dots here. He has a whole fan, so it really spreads out the contact point. And it seems to be much more reliable and, and not quite as likely to break things when you're taking them off of the supports. Uh, I think Printigo Severan is on Chapter 31 now. 
Holy smokes. And uh, chapter 31. And Medbury is nice because he does things that are just historical. They don't have anything to do necessarily with Lord of the Rings per se. But every so often, oh, it's uh, mini monster mayhem. They will also do the occasional Lord of the Rings, not Lord of the Rings stuff. They did a Balrog once, and then they did a whole series of trolls. And these were interesting because they had an unarmored version of this, so just the skin, and then they have the armored version. So that was kind of nice. I think they had four of them. It's only every so often that they do that. It's not all the time. But yeah, every so often they will do some Lord of the Rings themed stuff. They tend to do very different type of sculpts, uh, sort of like Lost Kingdoms. Sometimes the weird sea creatures or whatever. I think Archvillain has been trying to do that more. Uh, I think I think they've done kind of all of the regular style fantasy armies that they can do, so they're trying to branch out into more exotics. And like I said, Titan Forge has a spectacular release coming up in February with basically Conquistador theme. And that's going to be fantastic. I saw the renders of those, and I just printed out a bunch of their Lizard Man files. Really amazing stuff. Jim, let's see that model. It is, uh, you have been working on this. So hold on. You've been working on this for about an hour. And uh, here's the, oh here we go so basically uh, that's what he that's what he looked like and there there he is now a little, little over an hour Jim I love you and I think you're awesome you're one of my favorite painters but I'm just gonna say this with all of the love in my heart fuck you uh, <laughs> I uh, I drink that that's like mother's milk that's like unicorn blood to me I just drink that up. <laughs> One day I'm going to have to get out oil paint and try it. I mean, it looks like a lot of fun, too. Not just that it's, you know, it's there, but it looks like a lot of fun. And and it looks like it would be interesting to try. Um, I, I always suggest starting out with these things, these little, uh, these little uh, value charts like this. And you can make it even easier on yourself by doing this. Take one dark color, one light color, and just do this. So instead of having to try and figure out colors... Just get used to the texture of the oil paints, the consistency of them. This is like Van Dyke brown and light yellow. That's so, all this is. So what about you and I get together, and I have a model, and I could do it and do it in oil. Um, and if you want, I'll send you the file, and you could 3D print it also, although I did you know, supersize this one a little bit. And we could go together, and you can kind of help me work out how to do oil. But I have this model that I really, really like. That um, oh, for a second I thought that was Signum War Games right there. Oh, who makes that one? Uh, I think this was Raging Heroes at one point. I can't remember. I can't remember uh, who made this one, but I really like this model. I can send you a copy of it. So is he on about a fifty millimeter base ish, uh, something like that? Let me see. Let me grab a fifty mil. This one machine has lots of stuff on fifties, doesn't it? Eh, it's a little bit bigger than 50. I, I supersized it uh, when I put it on the printer. I just made it bigger just because I thought it would be cooler to do a, a bigger model. Maybe I, maybe that can be our my first um, oil miniature. We can work together on that. You can yell at me. No, you dumb shit. Do it like this. No, do it like that. And I go, okay, fine. Fuck it. Oh, boy, I tell you, uh, remember, uh, oh, I was using uh, Zoom for the that painting class there. Zoom is a, that's a nice platform. That yeah. worked out really well. It kind of had all of the kind of advantages of a live stream, but with the advantage of a private meeting. Yep. It was, and if you have a moderator to it, now it's even better because the moderator can be putting links into the chat and everything, and people could utilize the chat instead of talking over me. So that was a really I, – I enjoyed the heck out of that too. That was fabulous. I mean because I got plenty of those little makeup brushes so you know, or the makeup sponges to do everything. So I've got that. Yeah, that, I've got tons of those. And those are just like cut-up versions of the normal ones. 
Um, and I've got, um, I don't have the oil, so maybe you can send me, Hey, buy this one. This is the, you know, here's something that you're not going to break the bank with, but it's going to give you something cool to work with. You can send me a link and I can do that. Maybe we can do a, maybe we can do a hangout session and we can like, here, here's the model we're going to work on. Go uh, work on Dick it. Dick Blick is a fantastic place to get them from because the prices are already discounted and typically, well, right now, actually, Sometimes it's as little as forty-five dollars gets you free shipping. Yeah, and you could get, in in theory, you could get maybe something like this. So a, you could get something like this, just a, a cheap mo starter set. But then what you would be doing is tacking on uh, some additional colors. And what's nice is these are not expensive ones at all. So here's a, this is a super dark green, series one. This should be about six dollars fifteen cents. Things like, let's see, where's our Terra Rosa over here? Let me see if I can get to that. One second. Yeah, this is another one that's just a... Yeah, it's one, another one I use all the time. Series 1. Here's a Terra Rosa. So basically, these three tubes, maybe $6.50 a piece tops. And then something like an Indigo, okay, it's maybe 7 or $8. And, those are the, and I use the same colors all the time. There might be a dozen of them out on the palette, max. So could you put together of, hey, Gonzo, here's your basic starter oil set. Go buy this. Yeah, I can uh, point out a few things. Now, sometimes, if you're, if you're lucky, you see them on sale. Let me see if I can grab. Ah, here we go. I mean, I'll now, try to buy them local if I can first, because I always like to support my local you know, places. But if I can't, I get that in. This you may not be able to find at local places now. This Williamsburg paint, this is the highest quality of all the stuff that I have. Things like Gamlin, Winsor Newton, when you buy those starter sets, you're not buying the true artist oils. They're student grade. The only company that sells a starter set with their genuine paints is Williamsburg. Now, the tubes are smaller, but for you, you will not be using paint at the rate that I do. Because yeah. I'm doing all those color charts and all the videos and everything. So this would last you a heck of a lot longer than it lasts me. And every so often, uh, they have a nice sale on these starter sets. So instead of $60, you can get them maybe for 40 So for 40 bucks, you could be getting a starter set of genuine, of the highest quality oils. Whereas those other ones, okay, yeah, it's, it's 25 bucks, but you're getting more of a student grade kind of a thing. So you, you usually when you're starting out, you kind of combo with one of the cheaper student grade things and then uh, get some of the ones that aren't in there. Indigo, Terra Rosa, again, they're cheaper ones, but they're kind of crucial because all of this darker stuff that you see, uh, you need those type of darker colors to do that. The thing that where we splat all those dark colors on, wipe them away, and then start working back with the lighter colors. If you start to like the oils, these are things that are not necessarily a bad idea to invest in. And we still haven't figured out what kind of weird fairy dust is in these things. It's also <laughs> by Gamlin. It's only a Series 2, so you're looking again at 7 8 bucks a tube or whatever. But these radiant colors, they are really key for not just getting things lighter. Because if you just use white, everything starts to A, get chalky. It also takes longer to dry because white... These things, for whatever reason, actually make colors dry a little bit faster. There's no alkids in them, so we have no idea why that happens. There's nine of these. You, there's, like a, there's like a first three that you want to get. Then if you want to get more, there's a second three. The final three is like, well, if you really want them. But um, usually these things I'll recommend, the turquoise, the violet, and where's my green here? Yeah, these are the first three that I always recommend because these are great for skin tones. They're great for terrain pieces. They're great for leathers, plant, you name it, uh, metals. I use all three of these on my non-metallic metals all the time. So this is another little, if you want to treat yourself, right, or if maybe Dick Blick has a special sale on gamut paints, maybe there's an extra 5%, 10% off, maybe you say, mm, you know what, I'm going to snag me some of these guys. And again, you can, even for me, with all the charts that I've done and everything, you can see that these still there's a fair amount left in these guys so they will last you a long time and i just keep thinking of some of those uh like those trophies that you have to paint the awards and stuff for 
for war for a weekend, I keep thinking, boy, if you could do those with oils, first of all, it might be a heck of a lot faster, and it might be a lot cheaper doing them with the oils. Because you have to figure with oils, it's sort of like taking that really nice, soft restaurant butter and spreading that out <laughs> on a miniature. And acrylic paint, by comparison, is like peanut butter mixed with gravel, mixed with plaster, as far as how smooth it is to apply to a surface. So those some of those really big things that you're doing, well, you can still do all the glazy stuff, right? You just take some high-quality thinner and talk about capillary action. When you see the capillary action of oils versus contrast paints, contrast paints have no capillary action. It's it's very minimal, to say the least, because any acrylic paint that's based with water, well, water has a lot of, uh, it's a natural tension point. Oils don't have that. You can make oils flow against gravity. So if I was to hold it like this and do a pin line wash here, it would literally flow this way. That will never happen with the water-based stuff. It'll just want to sink down this way and not go anywhere else. But yeah, with oils, you could take a tiny little dot of pin line wash, touch it here, and it go right up the, right up that channel on that sword. I'll never forget. Someone didn't believe me. They said there's no way that happens. That defies physics. And I, I demonstrated it for them about seven times, and they were just kind of stand there with their mouth wide open as they saw the oil just literally defying gravity. But that's, that's, I, I also too, you do not need a bunch of hazardous materials. That's all the thinner I'm going to use. That's a water bottle cap. And that is super high quality odorless thinner. You can't smell this stuff. You're not going to use that to clean your brushes. You're going to use this. Oh, look also for dried acrylics. It's not hazardous, no vapor. Let's say you got oil paint on your hands or whatever. Dawn cuts through the grease. Dishwashing soap. Two seconds, warm water and some soap. Your hands are totally clean. So I know that for some reason people think that oils involve all these really hazardous cleaners and stuff. And nope, you do not need any of that stuff. Now, folks overseas, sometimes they have to get different things because they may not have what we have here. Like, say, the Mona Lisa odorless thinner. It's really hard to get that in Europe. But AK Interactive and MIG Ammo, they have high-quality odorless thinners. Heck, even Scale 75 has one now. Uh, their oil paint line is, well, you're just better off price-wise and, and such just using regular artist oils. There's There's never been a miniature paint line of oils that wasn't manipulated in some weird way that made them practically less effective than artist oils. And yeah, artist oils, pound for pound, will be a whole lot cheaper. Holy smokes, it's almost 8.15. You want yeah, to no. <laughs> get to your media section there. Um, well, that, and like I said, send me a list like, hey, get these colors and we can go from there. And we can, maybe we can do some, a cool little special like Gonzo fucks up oil paints for the first time. <laughs> With Jim giving him hell for it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll do something that has, like, we'll have you using fluorescent oil paints. That's That should be your first mm. miniature. We'll have you mixing your own fluorescent oil paints, and we'll have you mixing your own metallic oil paints on top of all the other colors. That'll be your very first miniature. And we'll do freehand and object source lighting and non-metallic metals. Again, <laughs> I just, I, I relish that. I, I just I just eat that up right there. So, all right, so we're going to go to the media section. I really don't have a lot this time. Like I said, we, um, there was not a lot going on. There's not a lot, a lot of new stuff. I did um, start Alice in Borderland, which is, I guess it's a Korean um, or maybe Japanese. I'm not sure exactly, uh, based on a, a, a manga and it's like a Squid Games type thing where these people are doing something and they're teleported to uh, everybody in the world's kind of gone and you have to play this game and you have to survive. You don't survive, you die, and you can only play so many. Uh, there's two seasons of it, so and it's dubbed, so I can watch it. 
Um, cause you know me, it takes me quite a while to get through something. If it's subtitled, it's got to really, really get me. Um, but it looked fine. It was interesting enough. I'll keep watching it. Um, so I'll just let it go. I'm not, you know, it'll be good something for me to watch, you know, while I'm doing stuff or just checking out. I'm not like wholly completely in it, but I'm okay with it. I'll have fun with it. Got no problem with it. Um, Something else I watched, and I watched the entire series of it. Um, oh, God, now I forgot the name of it. Um, it was a new Netflix show. And it'll come up in just a second. Lockwood and Company. Um, I guess Lockwood and Company is based on a, a book series. Um, and everything. And... They, they, they worded this as if Harry Potter met ghost hunters. And they're off on that type of judgment. I will tell you right now, it's not um, Harry Potter meets ghost hunters. It's more like... Um, what can I say? It's more like Umbrella Academy meets ghost hunters. And when I say Umbrella Academy... It's more of the rejects of this world doing it, not the super awesome, you know, superheroes wanting to challenge and do everything and be the super good guys. Um, supposedly in this world, ghosts are real. And if a ghost touches you, you die. And ghosts can do all these weird things. And there's like three versions of ghosts. Um, and like level three is like the super most powerful badass, you know, even some people don't even believe it exists because it's so badass. Um, and supposedly children are the only people that can really fight ghosts. Uh, adults have a hard time doing it. They have uh, an issue with ghosts and hard time seeing them. Um, and so you've got a girl that's like a medium that she can see and talk to him a whole lot easier than everybody else. Uh, <laughs> if Weasel is from... Uh, no, not that bad. Not Weasel. He's not that bad. Um, but it's a, a, a three-person team um, that goes on these things to try to stop ghosts. Um, they wield swords, uh, rapiers to be exact, uh, because they can fight ghosts with these rapiers. Silver is something you can use to fight ghosts. You know, there's They don't give a lot into the background and fluff of the world, which kind of upset me. Because I was like, I want to know more of it. Was it bad? I, I no, I just want I wanted more of the world history, not more of the story, I guess you could say. The story can come, but give us more world history of why the world is like this, what's going on, why you know, et cetera, et cetera. Why are ghosts so prevalent? Why is there a curfew all the time besides ghosts? You know, give me give me more. Um and it wasn't there and I was kinda upset with that. Um, and when they said Harry Potter, I was expecting, you know, this good elaborate fluff story, give us good, you know, minutia of things that are going on, but it wasn't there. And I was kind of upset with that. Um, the characters are fine. There's not a problem with them. They're, they're likable. They're understandable. You get it. Uh, some of the plot is, you know, you can see where it's going and what's going to happen. You can see how it's happening. So it's not that big of a, you know. You're not going to be shocked or surprised or plot twisted or anything, but it wasn't bad. Um, do I think it'll get renewed? I doubt it. Um, it just isn't enough. And with Netflix, they cancel at the drop of a hat nowadays. So, you know, if you're not hitting high mark numbers right off the bat, you're it's not going to be there. It's just not going to happen for you. Um, so I have a feeling it's not going to get renewed, um, which would do a disservice to it because it's got a lot to go for it. You can do a lot with this series. And like I said, the characters, I'd like to see more world building with it. Um, it gets my man rating of like 2.5 because it's just kind of there. So Jim, what do you got for us this week? We actually happened to see, was it Glass Onion? Mm -hmm. right, we we saw that now to sort of get familiarized with the universe. We, I think we checked out 
Knives Out mm-hmm. before that, just to sort of get reacclimated to that universe. Uh, so, I mean, you can almost do a twofer on the movies, and I don't want to obviously do any spoiler things, on, especially on Glass Onion, in case people haven't seen that yet. They're not really the greatest movies ever. I'm not even sure if they're really all that good of themselves, but the mindset I was looking for, I kind of wanted a demented version of Poirot, and that's sort of what we got. <laughs> there was this, they had a combination of the completely ridiculous with a little bit of sinister and a little bit of seriousness. Yep. And and you had the detective kind of a very quirky, and, and even the way it played out was very much like a Poirot episode. I mean, to the point where I'm pretty sure he's mentioned in each of the, you know, the Glass Onion and in the uh, Knives Out. It's the same character, but yes. It, it's it's very much like a Poirot, but obviously with a little bit of a twist because this is, uh, well, a few years later after that character. So for me, in some ways, that is actually what I was hoping to see was, okay, could you almost see the par- parallels to a Poirot episode and as long as I could do that, that was gonna that was gonna keep me satisfied on that. And we saw both of those. And what like is it to me, that was okay. If I was not, say, such an avid Poirot watcher, I don't know if it would have quite the same appeal. Uh, just like, you know, there's certain shows if you watch a lot of midsummer murders, you're gonna like this, whereas if you've never seen something like that, you're not gonna quite enjoy it so much. So, again, I don't know what other people thought of it. I don't know if you've seen that or not. I have. I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I thought it was really fun. Um, characters were very lively. Some of them you're like, yeah, this guy just needs to die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it was pretty obvious on certain things. But I think what makes the show better than anything is Daniel Craig's character makes the entire series. Um, and the way he does it and the way he acts and the everything that was written. Um yeah, I, I go with Kathy. Kathy was saying Glass Onion was a lot of fun, too. And I think that's the thing is, it was just a lot of fun. Um, and I like a good murder mystery. I like the way it, it, it was done. Um, and it, it was a murder mystery of the twist, but it was a good one. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, would I watch it again? Eh, probably not. But would I recommend it? Yeah, I would recommend it. Because his character was just on that borderline of the ridiculous to kind of be like a Poirot. Yeah. You know, the way he played it, it was, I don't want to say overplayed, but it was played up. And I mean, he even references it himself. He says, oh yeah, I put on the foghorn, leghorn accent and stuff. So he, he almost was kind of honing himself there. Yeah. And he almost, I was waiting for him to refer to himself in the third person the way Poirot does. It just, he kind of had his own, it was like Kentucky Fried Poirot, basically. <laughs> And it, it, Kathy's right. The characters are over the top um, parody or goofy versions of what you're looking for. And they're meant to be. And which totally makes the show. Because you're looking at it and you're like, yep, it totally makes the show because that's what they're looking for. And that's what they're doing. Because, uh, like, for us, we, we really enjoyed that. I just don't know if it would have maybe the same appeal for someone else who doesn't kind of uh, like the same genre of show as we do. That's the only way I kind of was couching that review there because I don't want to say, oh, yeah, it's fantastic, this, that, and the other. And someone says, what are you talking about? <laughs> and just because maybe they aren't, they don't get so amused by yeah, some do. of these other shows that, that we do. Yeah. No, I, I thought it was good. It was good fun. Um, what was another thing I watched? Oh, I finished Kaleidoscope. Uh, people don't know Kaleidoscope is a, um, sh- kind of like an Ocean's Eleven, but the way it is presented to you, um, is it's out of order and randomly depending on how you watch it. Um, I could watch it and my order is completely random for when you and Kathy watch it. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, kind of weird like that. I actually think it would probably be a whole lot better if you watched it in the correct order. Now they tell you, you know, when, whenever you go to watch an episode and it gives you your random episode, it says, Hey, this is six months before the heist. This is 10 years, you know, or whatever before the heist. So you're not left with this 
where is this attitude or where is this in the story? They tell you where it is in the story, which is good um, because you're not left guessing. I think it would be a better show if you watched it in order. And uh, if you Google it, somebody will tell you what the order is, the the correct chronological order to watch it in um, and stuff. So you can watch it in that way. It would make more sense. And you'll, you'll actually get shocked by the surprises. Because sometimes you don't, you get, you know, you don't care what the surprises are, uh, because there's like, oh, okay, I already know what's going to happen because this is three months after the heist, and we saw that, you know, right before the heist, and I'm like, ah, three months after the heist, so why do I need to watch the heist, um, type thing, and it kind of, it just kind of ruins some spoilers. It, it, it was doing a spoiler for me, so I think there's an there should be a way that you should watch this. I don't know the correct order, but I do recommend it. Besides that, go online, look up the correct order, watch in the correct order, uh, correct chronological order, and it'll be a much better experience for you. In my opinion. So, um, the last thing I watched this week was, uh, of course, um, not saying the last thing, um, uh, uh, robot um, wars is on and everything, and um, I am enjoying it this season. This season, there's a lot of damage. They changed up the rules, uh, type thing. Um, one of the um people that usually is on there isn't on there. Uh, which is Tombstone. His drive the the driver of that can't remember the guy's name. Uh, he had surgery and was fighting um, uh, pain in his hands and arms, and so he can't do that right now. Um, but in BattleBots, he had to he had to drop out for the season because he was having surgery on his arms, hands, wrist, or something. So kind of sucks that. Um, they're doing a little bit different this year. Nothing bad. Uh, some good fights. Um, a couple of them were just like, yeah, I don't care about this one. But overall, it's been pretty good. Um, BattleBots is always fun. I love seeing robots beat the shit out of each other and wrecking each other's up. Um, one thing I did watch that I want, if if you're a Willow fan, BattleBots is back, Hellboop, sorry. Uh, it is back and a new season has started. I think they're like three episodes, three or four episodes in already. Um, if you're a Willow fan and you like the original Willow movie, even if you don't like the new TV series, Go watch the Willow behind the scenes show. I can't remember what it was called. Um, behind the Magic or whatever. Um, oh, let me see if I can remember the name. It was. I told Kathy and John to watch it. Um, do, 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 do. Um, but yeah, Willow behind the Magic. It is a very much a homage to the old movie. And a play on the new TV series. And it was so interesting to watch. And it's hilarious as shit, too. Because they play a ton of jokes in there. The character, the, the actors are pretty funny in this. So, go watch it if you're a Willow fan. If you watch the TV series, go watch it. It is very much a love letter to Willow and the world and the people that played in the original and the people in the new one, I highly recommend it. It's only about 45 minutes or an hour long type thing, so it's not bad. But it is really good. Um, it, it it plays a lot of jokes on itself, so I highly recommend it. Um, Jim, do you got anything else before we get out of here? Because we only got like two minutes left. I do believe that is it, so we can make our AMS gray. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we appreciate you coming in. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you no matter what, even if you don't say hi to us, but you come in and just sit around and just chill with us. Um, other than that, guys, we're going to send you off, of course, to the Pyro Club. Um, Looks like they're doing D&D tonight, so we'll let you throw you off over there and let you hang out with them. Um, please take care of yourself. Please watch after each other. If you see something, say something. If you need someone to talk to, you need someone to hang out with, all of us are always going to listen. All of us will always hang out with you. Um, 
don't hesitate to reach out. For more than dice, I'm Gonzo. One day I'll be Kathy. <laughs> Good night. Make sure you hit that raid button. Go over and hang out with our friends at the Pyro Club.